about the 1940s, 1950s, people would try and investigate how the brain worked by using pulled glass pipettes that would break and fragment and you then you know, wouldn't be able to really figure out what neurons were doing because every time you tried to investigate it, the, the very thing you were using to do that investigation would buckle. Um, and David said that this you know, was not going to be the, the, there must be a better solution. So he started toying around in his basement with little pieces of metal and came across tungsten, which is a very strong type of metal, managed to find a way of insulating it so that it was just free of insulation at the very tip, which those of you who have taken Nero 100 now know is important to you know, only listen in on the electrical activity of one cell. And that development, which was published in a little paper in 1959, uh, has then transformed the field and opened up many different possibilities for studying. So for example, Mike uses tungsten microelectrodes to study how the brain works, and I use them as half of the neurobiology department at Harvard uses them. Uh, so David teamed up with uh, another colleague, uh, Torsten Wiesel, and worked in the department of Stephen Kukler down at Johns Hopkins, and there started to really unpack how it is that visual signals are transformed from light through into electrical signals and then through the hierarchy of the visual system to then recapitulate or build our impression of the world around us. And he worked using two types of animals, mostly cats and monkeys, because they have forward-looking eyes, like our eyes, and have a lot of the same kinds of visual behaviors that we have. Uh, and their work culminated in the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology in 1982. Um, we're also very honored because David accepted our dean's offer and extension to become a kind of honorary faculty member. We figured he does more teaching in the department than many of the <laughs> faculty in our own program, so... <laughs> or rather, he's made more of an impact on our students' lives, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> in, any, in any event, I'm actually thinking of Mark Tatel, who's on sabbatical this year. Um, uh, so, without further ado, it's a terrific honor to welcome David once again. And he's going to talk about the groundbreaking work that they did to, to unpack the early stages of visual processing. So, thanks, David. Good. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Bevel is always needlessly flattering in his introductions. You shouldn't take what he said seriously. I want to start in an un unusual way. I want to take your picture. And I have to have some way of proving to my children that I work for a living. And, <laughs> and but when I say children, I'm using the term loosely because our youngest child, I think, is something like 40 years old. But, so let me just, uh, this is a new camera. And so it's, it's wonderful to have a, a good toy. And, Good. <laughs> so that was painless <laughs> for you, I hope. Um, so um, for the last half century almost, <laughs> I've been starting most of my lectures, beginning lectures, with this picture, which is a human brain uh, taken from below. And when I give this talk to psychologists, I point out that this is the front and this is the back. But <laughs> that makes my wife cringe when I say that. And I have to be careful because I do a certain amount of what you might call experimental psychology these days. And a lot of my friends are psychologists. So this is how to, how to lose friends and influence people, I suppose. Uh, so as you can see, you have the eyes, the optic nerves coming out the back of the eyes coming to this structure, which is called the optic chiasm. Have you heard? Have they heard about this? I don't think probably. Do you have a pointer? Here. Uh, oh, good. Yeah. Great. Yeah, fine. So this is the optic chiasm. The optic nerve fibers uh, come out the back of each eye, a million from each eye. Uh, some of them stay on the same side, others cross to the other side at the chiasm, and they end up, the optic nerve fibers end up in the lateral geniculate bodies, 
which are clusters of cells about the size of a, and shape of a peanut. Um, and it's, it's a simple way station, if you like. Uh, a typical cell gets its input directly from an optic nerve fiber and it sends its axon directly out uh, back to the primary visual cortex, which I've drawn here like this. And the arrangement is such that fibers from this half of this retina stay on the same side and from this half of this retina they cross over to this side. So this uh, hemisphere, which I guess would be the right hemisphere if you turn it upside down, this hemisphere is getting its input from this half of this retina and this half of this retina, and so it's getting its input from the contralateral half of the visual field. If you remember that lenses reverse the image. <laughs> I give a course to, to Harvard freshmen and several of my students this year didn't know that the lens inverted the image and, and made it left to right. So I had to give them a little lesson in physics, but I, I'm sure that the, you people are, are above that. Anyhow, <laughs> the, the point of all of this is the, the, the left half of the world, one half of the world, sends its information to the contralateral hemisphere, that is the hemisphere on the other side, and vice versa. And this is something that I usually tell students that if you're blind drunk, you should be able to reproduce this diagram and, and, and remember it. It's, it's, it's a really important thing. And I remember once having said that to the, to, in a lecture, I, I proceeded to draw it on the blackboard because I didn't have this slide and I got it all wrong. So I think <laughs> they must have thought I was blind drunk. But the first year we taught medical students at Harvard, uh, we asked them to reproduce this diagram and, and to show how the left side and, uh, of the environment projects to the right side of to the right hemisphere. One student uh, got the optics wrong, so he, he he forgot that the image was reversed, and he thought the left side of the world came onto these two halves of the retina. But he also got the complete the the crossing at the chiasm completely wrong backwards so he ended up with the left half of the environment going to the contralateral hemisphere just as it should so we had to give him full marks for <laughs> for this and i thought it was the most ingenious answer that i've ever seen <laughs> anyhow that's that is the structure and uh, what uh, we can think of the brain consisting of structures, that is, clusters of cells, if you like. And so the first structure that you see here is, it would be the retina. Uh, these are third order cells. You have uh, uh, rods and cones that project to cells called bipolar cells. They make synapses with retinal ganglion cells, which are the cells whose axons leave the eye. So this you could look on the retina then as, as a rather complicated structure containing uh, probably five different kinds of cells, but three of which I've mentioned just just in the last few sentences. Uh, the lateral geniculate body, you could say, is a structure. There's about a million or maybe two or three million cells in this structure. Another structure would be the primary visual cortex. And if you counted the structures in the brain, I have no idea. I've never counted them myself. But if I had to make a wild guess, I, I think I might guess that there are, let's say, 200 structures. Uh, and I'm not even count, saying whether I count the two geniculates on each side as separate structures or the same. Let's say there are 200. And what we want to do in neurobiology is determine, if we can, what any given structure does. That is, the information coming into the structure, which in the case of the eyes is light coming in, from outside. In case of the geniculate, lateral geniculate, it's, it's uh, the optic nerves coming in and the information going out is uh, carried on the axons that go up to the primary visual cortex. So you have an input and an output to any given structure and the heart and soul, I suppose, of neurophysiology should be determined to, de to determine what a structure was. What does the geniculate do with the information it gets? How does it change it? 
uh, what does the cortex do to the information that comes in from the genicula. And of course there are probably 10 or 100 million fibers leaving each, each cortex on each side going to some other part of the cortex. So how does the cortex change the information coming in? What does it do? What is it there for? Is the question then that a neurophysiologist should be asking. And if you, if you want to think about how many structures of the 200, let's say, in the brain, do we know the answer to this question? Um, I would say it's something like four or five of the 200. Uh, the spinal cord in some sense might be one. The lateral geniculate is certainly one of them and the primary visual cortex is one. But other than that, that leaves 197 or 196 structures that we have no good idea what they're there for, what they do precisely on a cell level. And that's a scandal in a way uh, when you think of it. But it means that if uh, you decide to take up as your career neurophysiology, there's a lot of things that you could do. Uh, it, it would be a, a nice kind of career if you can figure out the answer to this for maybe one or two structures. Well, I'm uh, getting, <laughs> getting carried away and being a bit pleonastic, but anyhow, uh, let us look then uh, in more detail at some of these structures. The next, now how do I go from one slide to the next on this, this just machine? Push the down arrow. Uh, that one. Oh, very good, okay. So here is a, a simple way of regarding uh, the way in which the brain is organized. Uh, you can look on the brain as, uh, of course, it contains nerve cells, and at one end you have receptors. Their job is to take information from the outside world and translate that into nerve impulses or to nerve signals. Uh, so in the case of, of the retina, these would be the rods and cones, the, the two kinds of receptors that we have in the retina. And uh, these uh, would be the two, the three, just three kinds of cells in the retina. These would be the nuclei of the rods and cones, the bipolar cells, and the retinal ganglion cells, and these are the cells whose axons go to the lateral geniculate body. So this is a simplified, vastly simplified diagram of, of uh, how the retina is built up. And the, these cells, they send their axons to the brain, to the lateral geniculate body, which in turn sends their axons uh, to the cortex. And you get stage after stage after stage. And finally, sooner or later, you end up with motor neurons whose job it is to signal to the muscles and tell them to contract. And that would be a simplified way of looking at the nervous system. And so between this input and the output, you have, to, you have everything that the brain does, including consciousness and memory and the soul and all the rest of it. Here we will be dealing with, with the particularly with the retinal ganglion cells and, and what they're, uh, uh, how they work. And uh, to study those is the same as studying optic nerve fibers because the optic nerve fibers are simply the axons of the retinal ganglion cells. And then we look at the behavior of cells in two or three stages beyond that. So, um, yeah. Here is then a diagram of, of, of the retina. Again, very simplified, but you have the light coming in, the cornea, the lens, and here is the uh, inverted images displayed on the retina. And this would be a magnified version of, of the retina. From here to here, the full thickness of the retina is something like a quarter of a millimeter. So the retina is a very fine piece of machinery quite complicated, but these three kinds of cells are sitting there getting their input. The light uh, stimulates the rods and cones, which then send their signals to the bipolar cells, to the retinal ganglion cells, and then the axons come out. And you might 
wonder, if, if you're alert, <laughs> why this should be backwards. The light comes first to the cells that are furthest away. These are the closest to where the light is. And there are several reasons probably for that. Why it, it should have evolved in that way is, is certainly an interesting question. The uh, visual pigment, when the light hits it, is bleached and is changed chemically, and it has to be reconstituted uh, so that it gets back to where it was. It becomes, again, bleachable. And to do that, the uh, p pigment molecules have to leak out to something called the uh, uh, what's the what word am I trying to think of the pigment epithelium uh, which mops up the pigment and then sends it back to the rods and cones in its pristine form so that's you want these cells to be close to the pigment epithelium where the pigment is reconstituted and that probably has to do with the reason for it it's being backward but in fact no nobody really knows anyhow uh, the these are all transparent so the light doesn't have any difficulty getting uh, to where it does its bleaching and the uh, final signals then from all this go out the optic nerve to the lateral geniculate body so the question one of the first questions we want to ask uh, is uh, what is the behavior of optic nerve fibers? And that's where my story will start. Historically, that was the way it was built up because the first cells in the retina to be studied were retinal ganglion cells, which are these, these cells here whose axons make up the optic nerve. The reason for studying them first was, first of all, it was technically far easier to record from a retinal ganglion cell. It's right close to the surface, waiting for an electrode to come into contact with it. But uh, more important uh, than that probably is that retinal ganglion cells fire impulses. The other cells in the retina, for the most part, don't have impulses. They make uh, changes in the membrane potential in response to being stimulated. And since the axons are the order of a millimeter or so long, it's, th that's, they don't have to have impulses to get their signals to the next cell. So I, I assume that, that this is stuff that you've to some extent heard. Uh, but uh, impulses are particularly important for cells with long axons where they the information has to go a long distance. So the, the first cells then to be studied were the retinal ganglion cells because it was by far easiest to study them. In fact, we know far more about the behavior of retinal ganglion cells than we do about any other kind of cells. And the first important results uh, were done were uh, discovered by Stephen Kufler around 1950, and he was the head of our department, so he's a, a guy who we got to know very well. And one of the first things he did when he started doing neurophysiology was to study rat, cat retinal ganglion cells. And so the first part of this story is what has to do with what he found. Um, and there is a picture of, of Stephen Kufler. Uh, in a, a kind of a typical pose and a typical <laughs> mood. Um, and so what uh, the way he, uh, the way you do an experiment like this uh, is uh, let's say you're recording from a cat. You have a cat anesthetized and immobilized sitting on a table. Uh, you have to fit it with contact lenses so that the corneas don't dry out, which takes only about five minutes. Tears are very important in our lives. Uh, so you have a cat then facing a screen, and in order to stimulate the retina, you take a slide projector and just shine lights and patterns on the screen, which is just a way of getting light and patterns onto the, onto the two retinas. It's very easy to do, and... and um, you can turn the light on and off simply by, if you're uh, uh, sloppy <laughs> the way we are, uh, you, you turn the light on and off simply by putting your hand in front of the slide projector and you can move the stimulus back and forth by simply holding the slide projector and moving. Uh, Card-carrying neurophysiologists tend to spend 
months or years building pieces of apparatus that will move the slide projector just so and having a shutter diaphragm that turns it all, uh, turns the light on in a certain fraction of a millisecond, leaving it on for a certain length of time. But this is all completely unnecessary if what you want to find out is what the uh, retinal is doing. So here is an example then of the records that you might get. Uh, you, you record by putting the electrode into the eye through the sclera and, and right onto the retina. And as soon as you, it touches the retina, it's likely to record impulses from a retinal ganglion cell because they're the things that are furthest in front. And so these are the kinds of records that you can make. When the cell fires an impulse, if you attach the output to a loudspeaker, you hear the impulse as a click. And if you look on an oscilloscope, uh, this would be the tracing of the oscilloscope, and these are the impulses. Uh, uh, each of these vertical lines represents an impulse. And the time is, uh, you turn the light on, let's say, for a second, turn it off after a second, and this is the kind of record that you get. And this illustrates that you, by uh, shining uh, a, your light on the screen, uh, you can explore the retina to find the part of the retina that's feeding into the retinal ganglion cell that you're recording from. So you hunt around until you find a region which when you cross over it and, and the light hits it, it makes the cell fire faster. And it turns out then that uh, this cell responded to a small spot about a quarter of a degree in diameter uh, and a degree here, uh, it turns out that uh, a one degree, one millimeter on the retina is three degrees. But to understand what I mean when I say a degree, from where we stand, the moon subtends half a degree. So that gives you an idea how big this, this spot was. This would be uh, a, about uh, a quarter of a degree, let's say. And you turn the, uh, here's the first thing you see is that cells fire spontaneously. Uh, that is without any obvious stimulus. And if you find just the right region to shine this spot, you turn the light on, you get a terrific burst of impulses. This would be maybe 100 per second or something like that, which adapts down. Even though you leave the light on, it gets slower and slower. You turn it off, there'd be a pause, and then the spontaneous firing takes up. So uh, this then is what you call an on-center cell because the cell fires when you turn the light on. Uh, if you make the spot bigger, you get, as you might expect, a, a much brisker discharge. So that tells you that feeding into the cell is more than just this region. Uh, uh, probably a region rather like this is feeding into the cell and telling it to fire faster. But uh, to everybody's surprise when this was first done by by Kufler, if you make the spot still larger, you find that the response declines. Uh, so far from getting a better response, the bigger you make the spot, there's a point at which you get uh, into <laughs> losing out by increasing the size of the spot. And if you f try to find out what it there is about this surround here that is, the, is making this response weaker, you, if you use a donut-like stimulus here, you find that turning the light on makes the cell fire slower. So this cell is getting input then from two kinds of regions, a center and a surround, that are fighting each other. One is making the cell fire faster and the other slower. So this is called an on-center cell because the center of, the, of this region makes it, is what makes it fire faster. Um, the region, if you shine the lights anywhere else on the retina, it does nothing for this cell. You have to shine the light just in the right place, and obviously the way you shine it, exactly where you direct the light, determines whether you excite the cell or inhibit it. So this is called uh, an on-center cell, and the region of the retina that feeds into the cell, whether it's excitatory or inhibitory, the region is called the receptive field of the cell. And that's probably the most important term that you're going to hear today. This cell is only interested in what's happening in the world in one part of the visual field of the animal. And so you can say, look on the receptive field as the region of the world that, that, that this cell sees. 
Um, so th uh, to make this a, a little more vivid, uh, maybe we could see the first, uh, I have, <laughs> First thing you'll notice is the spontaneous firing of the cell. Yeah, this is this this is a, a moving picture of the screen that the animal's looking at, and we've drawn this little circle somewhere here uh, to show where the receptive field was because we determined that ourselves, and this is just to demonstrate what happens when you stimulate these different regions. So you're looking at the at the screen a picture of the screen that the cat was looking at when we did the experiment. And what you hear is the clicks, which is the spontaneous firing of the cell. And you can see immediately that when we hit the right region of the, of the receptor, when we find the receptive field and hit just the sensitive region, we make the cell fire like a machine gun. So, so. so this is the receptive field center. And you see there's a response, but it's much weaker if you make the spot bigger. So using a donut, you slow the cell down. You cut out the response. And when you turn off the donut, you get a discharge, as though to make up for lost time. That's called an off response. So shrinking it down gets rid of the inhibition and leaves the cell free to fire. And a slit works very well because it's, it's illuminating all of the center and only a small part of the surround. And this is just to show that the whole thing is circularly symmetric. This cell doesn't prefer any particular orientation of the slit. Okay, that's... So that's one kind of cell. There are about half of the cells work in just the opposite way. Uh, they have a receptive field center which inhibits the cell. And when you turn it off, you get a discharge. If you confine the light to the surround, turning the donut on gives it, produces a discharge. And when you turn it off, you get a pause. So the two kinds of responses are, are opposite to each other, and the way the whole cell behaves is opposite in the case of an off-center cell compared with an on-center cell, which is what you just saw. So the next, the next example shows uh, a illustration of an off-center cell. And uh, the, you have to remember that when you, you have a region of a receptive field, when you stimulate it, it turns the cell off, then turning the light off is going to produce a discharge, which is called an off discharge. So the two kinds of cells are, are sort of the opposite of each other in their behavior. Yeah, yeah. This is still the on center cell. So this will be the off center cell. There's the center of the receptive field. Turning the light off gives a discharge. Turning it on will inhibit the cell, but there's not much spontaneous firing to inhibit, so that's not too obvious. So you see the off discharge is much greater to a small spot than to a large.
So here it's the surround that's giving an on response, whereas in the previous cell it was giving an off response to the surround. Here we do the same thing. We compare different directions of a slit and show that we get a discharge when we leave the center region regardless of the orientation of the slit. So again the whole thing is circularly symmetric. This cell doesn't prefer any particular orientation of the slit. So that's probably enough of that. Um, now I just want to make a few points. This is an example then of two retinal ganglion cells, one of which was an on-center, the other was an off-center. And the main thing to carry home uh, about both these cells is that the response you get to a big spot is much less than the response you get to a small spot of just the right size. And uh, Supposing you record from a whole lot of these cells and compare what you find. This cell, if this is the retina, this cell had, let's say, a receptive field here with a center and surround. If you look at the next door neighbor of this cell, you're likely to find that the receptive field center is very much overlapping the first. They're not in exactly the same place, but pretty much the same place. And if you record from a hundred cells all over the retina, you find the, the same receptive field centers are all over the place. Uh, On-center cells and off-center cells can be next-door neighbors, for example. Uh, and if you record from enough cells, you find there's a variation in the center, in the size of the receptive field center. So cells who are, that are situated close to your fovea, which uh, corresponds to where you're looking, tend to have very small receptive field centers like that. And ones that are far out in the periphery where your vision is cruder, as you would expect, they are, will have centers that are much bigger. So, and two next door neighboring cells will have receptive field centers that are very likely to overlap. So if I stimulate a certain point in the retina, what I'm going to do is activate many retinal ganglion cells whose receptive fields are overlapping in this region. It's going to turn off many ret retinal ganglion cells, those that are off-center, and, um, and uh, any cell whose receptive field is situated, let's say, with the center here and the surround here, stimulating here is going to if it's an on-center cell, it's going to inhibit the cell because I'm stimulating its, the, the surround of the receptive field. So any place that you stimulate in the retina, you're likely to be doing many things. You're turning some cells on, some cells off, depending on whether the cells are on-center or off-center and whether you happen to be stimulating the receptive field centers of those cells or the surrounds. And so this is something you probably have to think about a bit because it's a lot of information uh, in, in just a few minutes. Uh, I think the main point is that when you stimulate any part of the retina, you're doing something rather complicated uh, because you've got two kinds of cells and all of the cells have a center and a surround. So that's um, the main point uh, about the retina. And let's, let us think a bit why the, the cells, uh, a cell should be uh, organized in this bizarre sort of way. What we found is here's a cell with a center and surround that's responding much more to if we confine the stimulus to the center than if we bathe the retina in light, the whole retina, because that will stimulate both the center and surround and the two are antagonistic. Uh, and that, in a way, is a good thing, because what you're interested in in looking at the world is not how bright things are, 
but it's the differences in brightness of different things. You're looking in, in shapes and you're not actually very good at judging how bright things are. And if this camera weren't automatic uh, in its settings, uh, it, it would care very much as to how bright things are. I would have to set the f-stop and the shutter speed and all these things that I, one used to have to do on old, older fashioned cameras uh, because a camera is very sensitive to the brightness of the world. But we're not. Uh, in fact, uh, if you take a newspaper and look at it here and look at it out in the bright sun, the headlines still look black wherever you are. But if you measure the light coming from the headlines and coming from the white of the newspaper, and if you do that here and outside, the result is really astonishing because what you find is that on a bright sunny day, the light coming to you from the black of a headline outside can be a lot greater than the light coming from the, news, the newspaper inside. And that takes a bit of thinking to realize how, how sort of un, unlikely it is. But uh, you want to keep the peer, appearance of the newspaper the same, regardless of the lightness of the light source. You're not interested in how bright the light source is. You're interested in reading the newspaper. And so the, the way this is done, the beginning of it is explained by the way the retinal ganglion cells work. Because here is a cell that doesn't care that much about diffuse light. It doesn't uh, register the intensity of, of the ambient light. It's, what it's registering is the difference between the light here and the light in the surround. So if I want to get a good response from a retinal ganglion cell, the receptive field looks like this. If I shine a border with bright light here and darkness here, then I'm stimulating a, 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 about half of the surround. And uh, if this is light, and uh, that um, will inhibit the cell. Um, so it, it's, it's contours not just spots that the, a cell like this is sensitive to, it's, it's contours, differences between darkness and light. The way they're arranged, uh, the receptive folds are arranged is such that this cell doesn't care what the brightness of the light is nearly as much as what's happening in the center that's not happening in the surround. And this is something that we're going to see at every level in the visual system as we go further and further we find that the cells care less and less about the brightness of the overall brightness of the, uh, of the world. And they're more interested in, in contrast to the exclusion of overall brightness. And so typically a cell in the cortex, which we'll come to in a few minutes, doesn't respond at all when you shine light in the, uh, on the retina. And this confused neurophysiologists at first because you take a flashlight and sh direct it right into the eye of the animal, you'd think that you're stimulating all of the receptors. And this would be a great way of stimulating any cell further down the line. And in fact, it's the worst stimulus you can use because the cells simply don't care about that. They care only about differences. Uh, and the start of this is with the retinal ganglion cell, where usually the center wins out over the surround. If it's a non-center cell, as you saw, a, uh, a big spot gives a non-response, even though it's much weaker than a small spot. But this, this process of uh, discounting the overall illumination of the retina uh, is Carry, is carried further and further the further you go into the nervous system. So you see it, uh, weaker responses to a big spot in, in a geniculate cell than you do in the retinal ganglion cell. By the time you get to the cortex, you don't see any response. And it was very hard for people to get going in this field because they thought that probably uh, diffuse light would be a powerful stimulus and it's anything but. Well, we should move on. Um, let's see what we have next. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll just skip these. Otherwise, you won't get home for supper. Um, this is a, 
a, a cross section. Now, where did I leave it? Yeah, um, of this peanut size and shape uh, structure called the lateral geniculate body. This would be the lateral. We have two, one on each side, and this, let's say this is the right lateral geniculate. From here to here might be something like five millimeters. These are uh, the structure is still strong, but you can see is still small. You can see that it's very much layered. The cells are are subdivided into six different layers. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and it turns out that this structure, as you saw in the very first slide I showed, is getting input from both eyes, getting from the same half of the two retinas of, of, of both eyes. So if uh, the way it is arranged is that all the cells from the contralateral eye. So if this is the right geniculate, uh, the contralateral eye would be the left eye. And all of these cells are getting their input uh, from optic nerves coming from the left eye. And the sequence goes left, right, left, right, right, left. Uh, why there are six layers, why there's this alternation of, of, um, of the eye feeding into the layers, we don't have any idea. Um, and as with so many things in, in neurobiology, there's a lot that, that is yet to be explained. Um, but the point is here that the geniculate, the structure as a whole, all these three billion cells or whatever the number is, all of them are getting input from, from the two eyes. Uh, but the cells in any one layer get their input from one of the eyes. All of these cells get their input from the left eye. The right eye doesn't feed into this layer at all, but it feeds into the next layer, and so on. So the, two, the structure as a whole is getting its input from both eyes, but none of the cells are getting their input from the two eyes. And uh, why it should be arranged like this, we don't know. The first place where you have input, single cells getting input from both eyes is, is the cortex. And the fibers from this structure go up to the primary visual cortex. So I, I can, uh, there's a lot more to be said about the geniculate, but uh, again, you have to get home for, <laughs> or to get to the dining room for supper. So uh, we'll go on up to the cortex and the next slide should show here is, yeah, just to orient you, this is uh, the brain of a monkey looked at from behind. So this would be the cortex. Uh, there's a lot more to the brain than the cortex, but it's just buried out of sight. So here is the cortex and the primary visual cortex, uh, which receives its fibers from the lateral geniculate. It is arrayed on this uh, smooth part of the occipital lobe, the lobe at the very back of the cortex. And it's arranged in, it's, uh, this is the smooth part of cortex. It extends into a fissure that you'd have to get in here and look at, but it, a, a lot of it is underneath this structure. So you're looking at about a third of the primary visual cortex on the left side. And to see what this is like in cross section, we, the brain didn't come like this. We cut this thing there, uh, here. And to see what the cortex looks like uh, under low power microscope, you could walk in here and look to your left. And the next slide shows what you would see. This is the smooth part that you've just been looking at. And the part that's continuous with this, that is sort of tucked in, is this part here. So all of this is primary visual cortex. And it's topographically arranged. That is, the retina is projecting to the geniculate and up to the cortex in a very systematic way. So the cells in the center of the retina around where you're looking, near the fovea, would be coming in around here. And as you, as you go further and further out and finally end up here, you're going to more peripheral parts of the retina. So any given region of the cortex is interested in what's happening a certain, in a certain area of where you're looking. And if this is the uh, left hemisphere that you're looking at, all this information is coming in from the eyes on the contralateral side, that is from the opposite visual field. 
Uh, and now the, the question we want to ask is, how do the cells here behave? And as I said, they've, the first people that recorded from cortex were, were uh, rather amazed because anything they did didn't seem to work and they couldn't get the cells to respond at all. And uh, they came to the conclusion that cells by and large in the primary visual cortex don't respond to visual stimuli. But uh, the first hint that that wasn't the case came from in our sloppy way. We found that standing in front of a cat an anesthetized cat and waving our hands could produce b vigorous responses, even though shining a flashlight into the face of the animal did nothing. And that turned out to be because the receptive fields are divided into excitatory and inhibitory regions, which just balance each other out. Um, and in a way, this, is, this has to be a good thing because uh, diffuse light bathing the whole retina is uninteresting. What you want is have to have cells that are sensitive to forms, to contrasts, to, to shapes. And uh, so it, the whole thing is organized in such a way that the diffuse light, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, is discounted. So let's ask ourselves then, how does the, do these cells behave in response to light? We know that they receive that they will respond if you wave your hands. But let's look at this at, under higher power. If we look at this, a region like this, um, um, you can see this is the primary visual cortex. This is the surface. This is the white matter down here consisting of fibers coming to and leaving the cortex. And these are the cells of the cortex. And if you know any anatomy, you'll know that you're just looking here at cell bodies. The, the dendrites and axons of these cells uh, 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 are, have many uh, branches, so you're only seeing a tiny percent of what there is to see in the cortex when you just look at the cell bodies. Uh, but um, in any case, the cell bodies are arrayed in layers where there are densely packed in some layers and loosely packed in other layers. And the fibers coming in from the lateral geniculate uh, come in and, and turn up and mostly they end in this part of the cortex here. And these cells have axons which terminate in the layers above and below. So the information coming in starts here and spreads through the cortex. If you record from cells in this layer, which for reasons that aren't that interesting is called layer four. If you record from layer four cells, you find that their behavior is very much like cells in the lateral geniculate body and in the optic nerve. I forgot to mention, I think, that geniculate cells act in very much the same way as optic nerve fibers. There, there are differences. The power of the surround to uh, buck out the center is increased at the geniculate level, but that simply means that diffuse light uh, is, uh, is still effective, but though less so than at the lateral geniculate level. Uh, but when you get to these cells, they start not to care at all about diffuse light. You have to have a center surround organization. They are organized, as, as far as we know, as centers and surround, but these cells are very small and they're hard to record from, and we don't know that much about them. When we come to record from cells above and below, we find that they have very interesting and very surprising properties. And I think the next example illustration will show the kinds of ways that these cells work. And the first is, shows the responses of a single, of a, what we call a simple cell in the cortex. Yeah. So this is the screen the cat's looking at. And we have our slide projector, which we're holding by hand. And we find that this gives a powerful on response. And we, we illustrate that by drawing X's so we can remember the region that, we, that gave us on responses. This doesn't give much of any response. To get a response above and below this region, we have to make the slit bigger, as you'll see. So 
So here's the opposite kind, an off response from this flanking region. And we show, draw triangles to indicate that this is an inhibitory region. It's giving off responses. And we'll show that it, it gives inhibition in just a minute. This gives very weak off responses. One, one miserable impulse every time we turn it off. But for the time being, we put triangles here to illustrate that we think this is inhibitory. Now, here are the consequences of this. So we say this cell is orientation selective. And this is the most common feature of cells in this part of the cortex. It's almost universal for cells in the upper and lower layers of the cortex. And here's diffuse light. So the cell just couldn't care less about it. It's like an acid-base titration in chemistry. The two effects buck each other out. Here's an off response indicating that this lower region is inhibitory, probably. But if we add in the upper region, it doesn't work. So that tells us this is an inhibitory region. Magic markers can have lots of uses. <laughs> There's not much spontaneous firing to inhibit, but turning it off gives a discharge. That tells us this is almost certainly an inhibitory region. Now, I should probably ask, I've been too verbose here, how much time do I have before you have to get out of here? And, Ten minutes? All right. Is that okay? All right. Let's have a look at one more cell. Um, some of them are more complicated than the cell you just saw. Um, that's okay. Oh, good. So this could be the next door neighbor of the cell that you just saw. So this is orientation selective, but to a different orientation. And you find that in the cortex as a whole, all orientations are re represented about equally. And we're just drawing the borders of the receptive field, the region of the screen feeding into this cell. <laughs> this seems rough and ready, but by the time you've recorded from a thousand of these, you get good at it. It's, uh, that's just to indicate that both directions of movement work well for this cell.
could we, let's just take a look at the end spout cell. This we call a complex cell. The next cell that you'll see that we started by calling it a com hyper complex cell, it's more complicated than the, the one you just saw, but it, it too is orientation selective. Uh, It's only responding to movement to the left. About half the cells are direction selective in this way. So this cell is special in that the line has to be just the right length to get the best response out of it. And we say that it's end stopped. Apparently there are regions above and below that are inhibiting and, and uh, canceling out the response to a short slit. And this is about the most complicated thing that we see in this part of the visual cortex. To see still more complicated things, we've got to go to the next regions of cortex that this area sends its axons to. Um, okay, I think that's... Yeah. So you can see when you sit there looking at these stimuli, there's a lot going on in your heads too. Presumably the same kinds of cells are firing. I guess luckily you don't have to sit listening to them all the time because if, <laughs> if you think of, of, I don't know how many cells there are in the primary visual cortex, it's the size of a credit card and under one square millimeter of this region of cortex there are 100,000 cells. So it's, it's many millions of cells that are acting when you look at a stimulus like this. And apparently what the cells are asking is not how bright the light is, but whether there's a contour of some kind, and if so, what's the direction of that contour? And you find that all directions are about equally represented. And it, uh, we don't have that much time. This could go on for another hour. But uh, if, you, if this is the cortex, and I put an electrode down through the cortex like that and record from 50 cells, one after the other, I find, I'll find that all of the cells prefer the, about the same orientation. Uh, let's say they all respond to an orientation like that. If I send the cell, uh, the electrode through diagonally or parallel to the surface, what I find is that as I go down, there's a regular shift of orientations that's very orderly. Um, and so we think of the cortex as subdivided into sort of columnar regions that extend from surface to white matter, this being white matter down here, um, uh, in which all of the cells prefer the same orientation. And all orientations are represented. And if you go from, uh, if the thickness of the cortex is two millimeters roughly, and if I go, uh, uh, it takes about one millimeter to go through all the orientations and get back to the one orientation you started from. So you have a certain region of cortex like that where all the orientations are represented in a very orderly, systematic way. Um, and these are called orientation columns for obvious reasons because they're they sit there like pillars and go from surface down to white matter. There's another kind of column within which all of the cells respond best to one of the two eyes. And these are called ocular dominance columns. And they're arranged, the arrangement is so that if this is the cortex, 
I send an electrode down like this, I I'll find all the cells prefer the left eye. If I go over here about half a millimeter, I'm likely to find that all the cells respond best to the right eye, and maybe only to the right eye. Um, so this, this part of the cortex is divided up into left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye regions. And if I look at the cortex from above, <coughs> What I find is that these are sort of parallel stripes. So all this would be left eye, right eye, left eye. These are called ocular dominance columns. So you can find uh, a whole lot of additional information by asking what are neighboring cells likely to be interested in and how is the cortex built up. And it turns out that it's built up in this sort of beautiful way like a crystal. Um, and um, the, is the, if you go on ahead, you come to the, um, the, yeah, this is what we all call our ice cube model of the cortex. Here we're looking down at the surface of the cortex, as it would be here. This is the thickness of the cortex, and it's divided into these slab-like regions uh, in which the cells favor one particular orientation, and this would be a left eye dominance column, right eye, left eye. Right eye. The two columnar systems aren't necessarily orthogonal. It looks that way here because it was just easier to draw. Uh, so in a way, the more you look at a structure like this, the more intricacy you find. But it's a very systematic intricacy. It's not a chaotic thing at all. Um, and this seems to be true of, of every area of the cortex that we know anything about. But the total number that where we know this kind of information is, is about three or four. <laughs> and uh, probably there, are, there might be 50 different cortical areas, some specialized for speech, others for audition, and so on. And we know something about three of the visual areas, a bit about uh, a very small bit about a few of the others. And from then on, it's midnight in a dark forest. So there's a lot of work to be done, but there's every reason to think that there's a lot of inter interesting information <laughs> to be learned about this. But one has only been at it for half a century, and, and uh, time goes very fast in this game. So all of this started, one started learning something about this around 1960, and here we are 40 years later still finding out new information about the primary visual cortex, which is the reason I've been discussing. And, uh, but there are three or four, as I say, three or four other visual areas about which we know something. Uh, but we have no information of this kind at all about the auditory cortex, except that the cells respond to tones, and some of them respond better to some tones than others. But what they're there for, why tones should be important, how we perceived speech, uh, it's uh, being kind to say that we don't have any idea about things like that. So the things we would most like to know about are things that we just don't know much about. So this gives you an idea at least about the, uh, I guess the take home message would be that if you study one area long enough and carefully enough, you can find out a lot of kind of inter intricate and rather beautiful information. And this is just one area of about 50 cortical areas that could be. And then that leaves the rest of the brain, the other 150 structures that uh, almost nothing is known about. So that's, uh, that's probably more than enough. <laughs> yeah.
Yes. Um, you talked about the on and the off center cells, um, but do you know anything about like what makes them respond differently to light? Just what? Structure? Sorry. What? Do I know? We know anything about what? Yeah. Sorry. Say the it again. question sort of is coming out of left field. But every time I go to have my retina checked, you what? Sorry. But I have my retina checked. Yes. And very, very bright lights are shone into one first of all, obviously they put drops in to enlarge the yes. the, the pupil. Uh, what happens is that my I hear this terrible noise in my ears. The light the, 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 light. the intensity yeah. of the light triggers right, right, an auditory right. effect. And I wanted to know if you yeah. ever come across that before. I, no, I haven't. And I wouldn't be able to explain it. My, if you had to make a wild guess, you'd say that probably in the brain stem, the midbrain or someplace like that is the place where you'd have a chance for information to uh, converge both from the eyes and from the auditory system. But I don't know that that's the case, and I really don't know how you'd explain why yes, you would hear I, noise. I, I go to Dr. Canolis, who is one of the top um, retina specialists, and yes. he said that he's never come across anybody right. who has right. uh, experienced this. Okay. It doesn't mean that I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the same. The reason why I think it might occur in the brainstem is that I think another thing that occurs in the brainstem is a bright light suddenly may make, make some people sneeze. I don't have yes. any idea why that should be, but it sounds like the same kind of thing. At least it has the same flavor. Well, it's as if my ears closed up, but it's also a roaring sound to it. I don't know. Very unpleasant. Um, they have something to do with the vestibular system. Yes. Because, uh, the vestibular system and the auditory system are closer to the I Maybe a certain proportion of the cells 
a small proportion that we haven't happened to, to be in court from are defend are very respond well to the use of that may be. And I think people have planned that, I think, in the past. But if you look hard enough, you find somebody that claims anything you want to say, we haven't seen such cells. Another possibility is that maybe all of the cells, or most of them, respond very <coughs> weakly to, to the view study. But if you have a million cells responding weakly, uh, you have to compare that with a few cells responding strongly. But the, the bottom line is that we don't know the answer. Uh, I don't, uh, but I think the uh, one possible answer is to deny the question, to say that if you've tried to do photography with a light meter, one of the first things you learn is that you're not very good at telling how bright the light is, how bright a light source is. You can tell to some extent if it's dazzling, then it may be painful, and that's because your pupils are contracted so much. But uh, I think you have some clue as to how bright the light is, but I think those are sort of secondary, indirect information. Um, but it, 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 the fact is I don't know the answer. It would, I, I've always taken the question, I mean, the, the way I've handled those questions by saying that when you turn the lights on, you increase lots of local contrast. You yes, can all of a sudden see edges and things. And now you're activating your visual system because you're creating well, the types of stimuli that are activating vertical cells, I, and that only happens when the lights are on. So I'm so not you would sure predict you that if you turn the lights on in a perfectly white room, you wouldn't be able to tell. We're not, we're definitely not very good at that. You can run keep your eyelids shut. You can still tell somebody turning the light on sometimes. It's not very good. I, you could tell, you, I mean, but, but, but the, the point then is related back to David's point earlier, which is that the sensitivity that you have at that level to just a, a change in the light level on and off is not, you're not very good at that. And perhaps then the weak sensitivity of your neurons to you know, diffuse light is sufficient if you've got enough of them that they're sensitive to. Uh, uh, another uh, point to be made is that contrast between two, a gray and a light gray and a dark gray or anything like that, white and black, is, doesn't depend on the brightness of the light source. It's independent to a large degree of the light source. So the contrast is the difference between the two. And that stays the same whether the source of the light is bright or, or dim until it gets to be very dim. So that's another possible way of looking at it. The bottom line is that we don't really know, but you're not, my answer would be you're really not very good at telling light like that. Um, All right, go for it. Okay, so I'm from a rural area in New York which is heavily populated by deer population. Woo. So if you're driving down the road at night and all of a sudden your, your high beams are on and you come across a deer and you know the, the, like the expression that, oh, frozen in the headlights, like a deer in the headlights. So is that because um, the deer aren't sensitive to diffuse light so they don't react because the lights are shining in their eyes and they aren't really getting any input so they just don't know how to respond? If, if the light is very bright, what it's doing is illuminating the whole of your retina. And the, the, the light goes into the retina and is reflected and it scatters all, all over the place. So that is one reason that we say that the light is dazzling. That's what we really mean when we say dazzling. It's so bright that you can't see anything. And it's because the whole retina is illuminated. Like snow blindness? Pardon? Like snow blindness? No one's right. Say, for instance, if the ground is covered in snow and the sun is really bright, you go outside, there's kind of a reflection. There's something called snow blindness. Yeah, but I, th I think it, bottom line, I think, is that if the light is brighter than the snow, bright, it, it, you're, you stop illuminating different parts of the retina differently. You're just illuminating the whole thing because there's so much reflected light inside the So there's both inhibitory and excitatory cells, right, within the retina. And if you shine the entire light within it, then it just becomes neutral. They're both firing, so you can't. No, what's, a, what's inhibitory and excitatory? Each cell has a receptacle that contains that 
consists of the two parts, and when you illuminate both of them together, the cells tends to sit there and do nothing. I think so. Uh, so, but the on-center cells and the off-center cells aren't interacting among themselves. Each one is an independent of sending its information, and they're not canceling each other. It's the difference, the different regions within the receptive field that are canceling each other. I don't know how you're going to get by. Thank you.